The house was a small, two-story affair, with white siding on the bottom floor and gray shingles on the top. Three windows were facing the street, a large picture window, a small rectangular one above that, and another large window below it. I got out of my car and walked towards the door, knocking twice before it opened. A woman stood there, wearing a blue dress with her hair tied back in a bun. She had bright green eyes that seemed to sparkle when she saw me standing outside her house. Hello, she said cheerfully. Her voice was soft, but carried well through the night air. Hi, are you Miss Tanner? She nodded. Yes, I am. She smiled again and stepped aside so I could enter the house. It smelled odd inside. Not bad or anything like that, just strange, like old books and dust. Please come in. I entered her living room. It wasn't much more than a couch and a coffee table, an end table with a lamp on it. That's all I really needed for a place to sleep. The walls were painted yellow, which looked nice against the dark furniture. The carpet was black and covered most of the hardwood floors. There was a small kitchen off to the side of the living room with a sink, a stove, and a fridge. Everything was clean and tidy. Sorry for the mess, she said, while pointing to some boxes stacked in the corner. My husband died last year, and I just haven't had the time to get around to moving everything yet. No problem. I don't mind sleeping in a bit of mess. She chuckled. Well, if you want to put your things away, feel free. Just make sure not to take too long, since I have to leave in a few hours. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I'll be right back. She disappeared down a hallway. As I looked around the room, I noticed something else odd about the house. The walls weren't straight. They bulged outward here and there like they'd been pushed from the inside out by someone, pushing their way through them. It was subtle enough that I didn't bother me at first, but as I looked closer, I realized that it wasn't just the walls. Every single surface in the entire house had these little imperfections, including the ceiling and the floor. I heard footsteps coming down the hall and turned to see Miss Tanner returning with two glasses filled with water. She handed me one and took a seat on the couch across from me. So, what brings you out this way? She asked as she sipped her drink. I'm looking for a friend of mine. He went missing in the area about a month ago. Oh, that's dreadful. What happened? He just vanished. I paused as I thought about how to explain. He was staying in an abandoned hotel nearby and never came back. We think he might have gotten lost in the woods. She shook her head sadly. That's awful. Is there any chance he survived? Maybe ran away somewhere? I don't know. I hope so. She sighed heavily and leaned back on the couch. I'm sorry. I wish I could help you find him. We sat quietly for a few moments before she spoke up again. I don't mean to pry, but are you sure he isn't still alive? Maybe he's hiding somewhere or something. Well, maybe, I said hesitantly. Do you have any idea where he might have gone? I'm not sure, but I have a hunch. She laughed softly and shook her head. Well, let me know if you hear anything about him. I'll keep my ears open as well. Thanks. I better get some sleep now, I said, standing up from the couch. Of course, I'll show you to your room. I downed the glass of water and placed it on the table. Even that seemed crooked. Thanks again for letting me stay here. You're more than welcome. Please feel free to use anything in the kitchen if you need anything. I will. I followed her down the hallway to a staircase leading to the second floor. At the top of those stairs was another hallway that led to three doors. One on each side and one at the end. She pointed to the door on the left. That one's yours. No one else is staying this weekend, so other doors will be locked. She opened the door to my room and flicked a light switch. There was a dresser opposite the bed with a window above it and a small bed with a nightstand next to it. The wall behind the bed was covered in posters of famous horror movies. Slasher flicks, mostly. This should be all set up for you. She motioned towards the bed. Make yourself comfortable. My room is on the third floor if you need anything. Thank you. I'll keep that in mind. She walked over to the door at the end of the hall and closed it behind her before disappearing into her own room. I took a look around my room before lying down on the bed. The sheets were clean and smelled nice. 
but I couldn't tell whether they'd been washed recently or not. As I got under them, I noticed something strange about them. They felt heavy, like they were weighted down on one side. When I tried to lift them up, they wouldn't budge. I rolled over on my back and pulled at them, but still no give. Something was definitely wrong with this place. I lay there staring at the ceiling for a while before drifting off into a deep but restless sleep. I woke up sometime later to a knocking on the other side of my door. I sat up and rubbed my eyes before standing up from the bed. Who is it? I called out, walking over the door. There was no answer. I unlocked the door and cracked it open. It was dark outside, but the moon was bright enough that I could see everything clearly. I stepped out into the hallway and saw nothing except darkness. Hello, I called again, but once again there was no response. Is someone there? I asked as I turned around slowly. I heard another knock from behind me and spun around only to catch sight of Miss Tanner standing in the doorway to her room. Her hair had fallen loose from her bun and hung down past her shoulders. She was wearing a white tank top and blue pajama pants with red stripes down them. She looked like she was trying to hide herself by covering her face with her hands, which were pressed against her cheeks. Miss Tanner? She didn't say anything, continuing to stare at me with wide eyes. Are you okay? I asked as I approached her. She nodded, but kept her head down. What's, what's happened? I asked as I reached out to touch her shoulder. She flinched away from my hand and backed up until she hit the wall behind her. Then, without saying a word, she ran down the hallway and disappeared into the shadows. I stood there for several seconds, dumbfounded by what had happened. What the hell had I just witnessed? Was it real? Or was it just one of those dreams or hallucinations brought on by stress or exhaustion? I went back inside my room and locked the door behind me. I grabbed my phone from my pocket and checked the time. It was after midnight. I'd been asleep for hours. I sat on the edge of the bed and stared at the poster of Friday the 13th hanging on the wall above the desk. Why would Miss Tanner act like that? And why would she try to hide from me when I touched her? It made no sense. I sighed heavily and laid back down on the bed. I wanted to go back to sleep, but I knew I couldn't fall asleep now. Not until I figured out what was going on here. Maybe if I waited long enough, she'd come back out and explain herself. I must have fallen asleep eventually, because suddenly I was shaken awake by someone pounding on the door. Wake up! I jumped up from the bed and opened the door to find Miss Tanner standing in front of me, with her hands balled into fists at her side. W what's wrong? Get dressed. You, you have to leave right now, she said frantically as she began to pace back and forth. Why? You don't know how dangerous this place is. Get your things and get out now. What are you talking about? She stopped pacing and looked me dead in the eye. The house is cursed. What? It's haunted. There are spirits in this house. I laughed nervously and shook my head. There aren't any ghosts here. Then what do you call that thing you saw earlier tonight? I don't know what you're talking about, I lied. Was she talking about herself? I'm not leaving until I get some answers. Please, just go. If you stay here much longer, something bad will happen to you, just like your friend. My friend? Just go, she yelled. She started running downstairs. Wait, I shouted after her, but it was too late. She was already halfway up the steps before she turned around and glared at me. Tell me what happened. He died, she said simply. How? They got him. Who? The monsters. I blinked at her and tried to process what she was telling me. Monsters? Yes, the monsters. They came through the walls and they took him away. Are you insane? I screamed at her. There's no such thing as ghosts or monsters. She frowned at me and shook her head. There are more things than just that. Then she pointed to the floor below us. You need to leave right now before they come for you next. I can't leave. My friend might be here somewhere. He could still be alive. She let out a frustrated sigh and walked over to the window. She pushed aside the curtains and looked outside. The moon was bright enough that I could see everything clearly. I followed her gaze out the window and saw nothing except for darkness. She pulled open the window and leaned out into the night air. He's leaving, she called out into the darkness. 
I heard a low growl coming from what sounded like inside the walls. Miss Tanner slowly backed away from the window. Then, without warning, she fell backwards onto the ground. Her body hit the floor with a sickening crunch and didn't move again. I stood there, staring at Miss Tanner's broken form lying on the floor for several seconds, before turning around and sprinting down the stairs. The whole house began to creak and moan, and it appeared as if the walls were closing in on me. I ran past the kitchen and the living room, both of which appeared to be untouched, and headed towards the front door. The only light came from the moon shining through the windows of the hallway. As I approached the exit, I felt something grab hold of my shoulder and pull me back. I spun around quickly to see a figure standing in the shadows behind me. It was tall and thin, with oily skin and long black hair. Its face was covered by a mask made of human bones. I struggled against its grip, but couldn't break free. The walls looked as if they were melting, and more human bone-masked faces were emerging from all around me, surrounding me on all sides and closing in on me until I couldn't breathe. I reached out to touch one of them, but only grabbed hold of empty air. Then suddenly, I was dragged back through the walls, felt myself descending into that pitch-black abyss beneath me. I woke up gasping for breath and sat right up in bed. My heart was racing and my body was soaked with sweat. There was a loud bang on the door and I jumped out of bed. I unlocked the door and opened it slightly, just enough to see who was knocking. But when I did, I wasn't surprised to see Mrs. Tanner standing there with her hands balled into fists at her side. Get dressed. You have to leave. Right now. Miss Fiora, can you please come to school as soon as possible? Miss Morgan, the school guidance counselor, asked. Julian isn't hurt, but he's in a very serious situation. When I asked what happened, Miss Morgan said it was better to explain when I arrived. Bewildered and unnerved, I feared the worst when speculating what my eight-year-old might have done. Julian could sometimes be a bit unruly at home, but never once got in any trouble at school. Julian's teachers loved him, and he appeared to get along with all of his classmates, which made this so unusual. Despite pondering every conceivable scenario during the drive, I never would have guessed what my son had ultimately done in a million years. My stomach sank when I saw an ambulance and a trio of police cruisers in front of the school. After parking in the visitor's parking lot, I was greeted by Mrs. Morgan, Mr. Quatero, Julian's teacher, Mrs. Jones, the principal, and two police officers, one of whom happened to be my cousin, Brady. I noticed none of them looked angry. They all had the same disturbed looks of horror and disbelief across their face. Miss Fiora, thank you for coming so quickly, Miss Jones said. Where's my son? I asked anxiously. What did he do? He's with Miss Isbister right now, the school psychologist, Miss Jones quickly replied. Before I could ask any questions, Brady stepped forward and took me aside. Look, they figured it'd be best if I tell you what's going on, so brace yourself, Brady said softly, taking a breath before continuing. Julian brought a head to school. An actual human head. What? Was all I could gasp out, after not saying anything for a few seconds, unsure if I'd heard Brady correctly. He had it in his backpack. Did you see him leave the house today? I waited with him for the bus like I always do every morning. I was unsure if there was a hint of suspicion in Brady's voice. I had no reason to think anything out of the ordinary was going on. When I asked Brady what exactly happened, he motioned for Mr. Quatero, who slowly walked over to where I stood. Mr. Quatero was visibly distraught over the incident, as indicated by his trembling hand, ironically only having four fingers, when we briefly exchanged a shake. When Brady asked him to recount the happenings, Mr. Quatero swallowed nervously before beginning. The kids were supposed to have show and tell yesterday, but we just couldn't get to it in time. So I had them do it today before lunch, Mr. Quatero said, his face contorting with disgust while giving the account. When it was Julian's turn, he, he said he brought in a special friend. He just pulled it out of his pack like it was nothing in front of the whole class. Julian said the head was his Uncle Milty, Brady added. He doesn't, he doesn't have an Uncle Milty, I said, staring mystified at my cousin. Did he say where he found it? He said the head was growing from the ground in the woods behind your house. My blood ran cold and my mind started racing. 
I wasn't sure what rattled me more, Julian seeing and physically handling a human head, or the grim prospect that someone's remains were discarded, a stone's throw away from where my family slept. Julian wasn't allowed in the woods bordering the backyard unsupervised, and even when permitted, knew he had to stay within view. When could he have made such a gruesome discovery without us knowing? Take me to my son. Julian was playing with Legos in Miss Isbester's office when I entered, seemingly unaware of the situation's severity. Miss Isbester said Julian was immediately brought here, while he and Mr. Quatero tried getting his class under control. When I asked if Julian explained why he did this, Mr. Isbister's answer sent a sharp chill down my spine. He said Uncle Milty told him to. Mr. Isbister let Brady and I speak with Julian alone in his office. My son was elated to see me, and seemed under the impression that this was some kind of special occasion. The innocent, unsuspecting look on his young face showed Julian appeared unaware that he'd done anything wrong, which for me made this ordeal extra difficult. Julian, do you know what's going on? I asked while sitting with him on the couch. Do you know why we're here right now? Julian's smile faded when he saw how concerned Brady and I looked. Julian, who's Uncle Milty? I asked, when my son's eyes started to wander around the office. You don't have an uncle with that name. He lived in a hole behind our house, Julian said nonchalantly, appearing more interested in getting back to playing with the Legos. I'm helping him find a new home. Brady and I looked at each other, both of us visibly perturbed by Julian's answer. What do you mean, cuz? Brady said quickly, seeing that I was at a loss for words. Can you tell me exactly where you found the head? I mean, uh, Uncle Milty? Julian's smile returned. I was trying to find a ball I hit really hard into the woods, and I found him sticking out of the ground. I knew the exact day Julian was referring to, this past Saturday afternoon. Julian and my husband had been playing baseball, when he had an absolute howitzer that sailed into the tree line. Although they spread out to find the ball, my husband said Julian was always within view. It took over half an hour for them to find it, and I do remember losing sight of them quite a few times while they searched. Julian must have found it then, I thought, becoming deeply unsettled when I imagined the naive look on his face when he made such a grisly discovery. Would you be able to show us where you found him? Brady asked. And... Did you take Uncle Milty with you the day you found him? Julian shook his head. I visited him again before he told me to take him. He lived where the woodpile used to be. Julian was talking about a large mound of firewood in our backyard. It took a few days, but my husband and I had relocated all the wood to another part of the yard. Its original location was a few yards into the tree line. We wanted to build a shed there, but wound up finding a better spot, despite clearing the area. I nodded at Brady, indicating I knew the exact spot Julian was describing. Julian, what do you mean when you said he told you to take him? Who are you talking to? Julian looked at Brady perplexed. Uncle Milty, he told me that I could take him with me. So you've been talking to this Uncle Milty head, like how the three of us are talking right now? I asked, tightly pursing my lips when Julian nodded his affirmation. I don't know what I'd have said if someone told me earlier today my son would bring a human head into school that was also his imaginary friend. Mr. Isbister said Julian may have been severely traumatized by what he found and imagined that the interactive qualities were a way of coping. When Julian was getting looked at by the school nurse, Brady took me to see if I recognized the head's face. The severed head was kept in an ice-filled cooler out in the ambulance. It was in a large, clear evidence bag, and looked to have only died fairly recently. I didn't recognize the man, who appeared to be in his thirties and had a bloated face with narrow cheeks, large black eyes, a Roman nose, thick pink lips, and short blonde hair. His eyes were still open, looking in different directions, and the mouth hung agape, its tongue partially protruding from between its teeth. The head's whitish beige skin had patches of mottling, darkened veins, proverbial deathly gray tints synonymous with corpses. I only looked long enough to verify I didn't recognize the man's face before having to suppress an upcoming urge to vomit. Julian was medically and physically evaluated before we were both interviewed by detectives at the police station. We didn't get home until later that night, and by then, a forensics team had already set up shop on my property. 
Brady kept me informed and was at my house monitoring the situation. The whole area in front of my home was quarantined off by yellow police tape and jam-packed with a sundry of police vehicles. Brady and one of the detectives met me at the perimeter. I kept Julian near me while walking up to Brady and the other detective, who had me bring my son inside when we spoke. Our cadaver dogs instantly picked up a scent and brought us right to the spot your son mentioned. The detective, whose last name was Vendetto, began, We unearthed a shallow grave containing the remains of a body. A headless body. Despite largely expecting this, hearing someone confirm that it was actually real made it no easier to accept. There was a corpse buried on my property that nobody probably would have found if we hadn't moved a heaping woodpile. A decomposing body my son had the misfortune of discovering. No child is ever meant to experience those kinds of realities life offers at such a delicate age. Although Julian maintained a reserved exterior thus far, I shuddered to think what actual thoughts and impacts this experience might have on my son. If it really was where the old woodpile used to be, which was there before I ever bought the house, it had to have been there for a long time, right? I inquired, particularly emphasizing how the woodpile predated when my family lived at the house. Well, that's the thing, Brady replied, getting an approving nod from Detective Vendetto. Whoever's head Julian found has probably only been dead for seven or eight days tops. The other remains were buried there for a while, years probably. I squinted in confusion at Brady and the detective. So, they're looking for a body right now. There's two out there. Maybe not here, Detective Vendetto said. We haven't found any more remains yet, but we think someone might have dismembered and dispersed another body, whose head your son found. It didn't make any sense. There was no way the head Julian found and decapitated remains they discovered were the same person, but I couldn't chalk up Julian finding the head where a set of other remains lay as a coincidence. Without any substantial proof, however, we were only left to speculate. Despite a thorough search of the woods behind my house and surrounding area, no additional human remains were ever found. Since the body was on our property, we had to be formally cleared of any wrongdoing. While undergoing that process, more peculiar happenings occurred. Two days after the incident, Brady told me that the head Julian found went missing at the police station, seemingly disappeared overnight without a trace. One week later, Julian's teacher, Mr. Quattro, was killed. Only his severed head was discovered. The man's body was never found. My husband and I kept Julian out of school since that day, and were considering transferring him so he could have a fresh start. Hearing news of his teacher's demise, which I kept away from him, prompted us to go through with the move. Even before eventually selling the house, we packed up and relocated to a new town, Julian adjusting well, despite still receiving therapy to help him manage his understanding of what had happened. Always speaking of Uncle Milty in high regard, if he ever came up in the conversation. Our new home was closer to my job, and Julian made friends quickly at his new school. About three months passed since his show-and-tell incident. It was Julian's birthday, who I hadn't gotten a chance to call since my morning and early afternoon had been filled with back-to-back -back meetings and calls and appointments. I was already behind schedule and putting the final touches on a report that was 15 minutes past due. I heard my office door open, which I knew was my final appointment before lunch. Keeping my eyes glued to the computer screen, I told my client to sit tight for five minutes, determined to have this write-up finished and sent before shifting gears. I heard him mutter something under his breath in a disgruntled tone before walking up to one of the chairs in front of my desk. While finishing the report, I pulled up my calendar to view my meeting details, since my assistant made some last-minute changes to the morning schedule and failed to specify what they were before going to lunch. Soon as the appointment opened on my screen, however, I heard the abrupt footsteps of the client walking towards the door. I'm so sorry about that. I didn't mean to be rude, but... I was worried my inattentiveness may have rubbed him the wrong way, but I quickly pulled my eyes from the computer just as he was about to leave the office. I caught a long enough glimpse to remember his face, long and narrow with beady, sly-looking black eyes, reddish-pink lips that formed a half-smirk, a balding forehead, and short, dark hair. Adjusting his fleece-tall neck collar, he looked at me with disgust and disappointment before closing the door behind him with his hand. I quickly stood up and tried to gesture for the man to stay, kicking myself for being so inconsiderate, 
and dreading the possible ramifications of this misstep. He looked oddly familiar, I thought while hurrying across my office. Hoping to catch him, I swung the door open, but he was already gone, stomping away in frustration. I slowly shut the door, thankful my assistant didn't witness my spectacle. Turning back to face my office, I froze after noticing a package on one of the chairs. It was a square box, about 14 by 14, and gift-wrapped in plaid red and green paper. There was a card taped to the top of the package, addressed to my son. Upon reading it, I was hit with a spinning lightheadedness when I remembered where I had previously seen that man's face. Dear Julian, wishing you a happy birthday, as promised. Thank you again for helping me to get a new look. We'll talk soon, Uncle Milty. I stood there, holding the card in my shaky hands, constantly rereading the handwritten note inside of it, while trying to comprehend who was just in my office. However, it wasn't his face being that of a severed head Julian had found, which had filled me with paralyzing terror. The man's hands he'd used to shut the office door behind him with only had four fingers. Don't get drunk and break into the cemeteries in New Orleans. And if you do, don't piss off any of the tombs with a bunch of X marks all over it. I did that six days ago. Saturday. And I've died every day since. After leaving the cemetery that night, I stubbed my foot stepping out on the curve and broke my neck on a wall outside a bar. I dreamed of a woman that night. She wore a white dress and stared at me. But... I couldn't have dreamed anything. Do the dead dream? Sunday morning, I woke up in my bed with no hangover. I had a clear head, which was rare for me in the morning, but the details of the night before were a little hazy. I checked myself out in the mirror, but didn't see any signs of damage. I remember tripping on the curve, then the wall of the bar rushing up towards me. I was so drunk that I didn't put out my hand to catch myself. Then, only blackness. Pushing the thought away, I started my day. I left my apartment and walked down the block to the corner diner. Most mornings, I needed coffee to chase away my hangover. No hangover that morning, but the craving was still there. I sat at the counter and ordered. A tall, very dark-skinned man was sitting at the counter. He was dressed in an old-fashioned dark purple suit. He had coattails and all. He stood as I sat down and said good morning, and made his way out of the diner. Be seeing you later, he said to the diner. Everyone ignored him. I turned and looked at him as the door was slowly swishing shut. He tipped his hat to me as he was putting it on. His smile was yellow like his eyes. As the door swung shut, I could see him lighting a cigar. I think he winked at me. After my coffee, I walked over to Jackson Square. Maybe the fortune teller could tell me something. They all turned me down. The real ones did, at least. You can tell which ones are real. After the failure, I walked back towards the river. A carriage horse got spooked by some tourists lighting firecrackers and caved in the side of my head with a kick. Monday, I woke up again in my bed. This was really happening. I searched the news, but there were no stories about a horse killing one on Decatur Street. I gave in and decided that the only thing for me was to get nice and drunk. I was sober for a whole day. That was an accomplishment for me. Well, sober for a morning at least. That night I tied one on. I couldn't get enough. At one point I think I remember that tall guy from the diner buying me a drink. What was this? I asked as he handed me a double shot of something dark. Oh, it's always rum for me, baby he said before throwing back his shot. I didn't care. I would have drunk anything that night. Be seeing you around, he said, before fading into the crowd of the bar. I was shot in the back while walking home. They killed me for the nine dollars I had in my pocket. In my dreams that night, the lady in white was sitting on a short stool with her back towards me. I walked towards her, but she never turned around. No matter how close I got to her, no matter how far I stretched my hand, couldn't touch her. Tuesday, I decided to stay in. If I didn't go out, I couldn't die, right? My thought was to drink a fifth of vodka and try to take a bath. 
I must have passed out, because when I came to, the water was freezing. I slipped getting out of the tub and bashed my head on the rim of the toilet. I still couldn't reach the woman in white. She was working with something in her lap. Every time I walked around to her front to see what she was doing, I would just be looking at her back again. Wednesday, I believed the bed would be my sanctuary. Surely nothing bad can happen to you in bed. Things were going well until I smelled the smoke and heard the sirens. The fire must have started in an apartment below me. I threw open my front door and ran for the stairs. They collapsed as I made my way to the landing. Since I was on the top floor, I had nowhere to go. Resigned, I walked back inside. People were staggering out of my building onto the street below. A crowd formed across the street, and some of them were pointing up at my window. The tall man was standing amongst them, smiling up at me. He tipped his hat as my floor collapsed, and I fell into the inferno below. I found out what the woman in white was working with. This time she was standing. She had a dead chicken in her hand. With a quick motion, she twisted and wrenched the head from the bird. She began chanting and moved in a circle, making a ring of blood on the ground around her. I called to her, but she ignored me. Right before I woke up, she glanced up at me, glaring into my eyes. By Thursday, I'd given up. Whatever was happening to me was out of my control. My room was like it always was. No sign of a fire. As soon as I got up, I went straight for Bourbon Street, because the bars never closed there. With an empty stomach, I got to work. Even on Bourbon Street, drunks aren't well tolerated before noon. After getting kicked out of the third bar, I sat down on the curb with a big-ass beer. The tall man sat down beside me. We were quiet for a few minutes before I asked him, Why is this happening to me? Now, now, don't worry about that, Cher. Just a few more days and it'll all be over. Now, if you hurry, there's a party bus carrying a bachelorette party about to cross Bourbon Street just a few blocks that way. He pointed down the street. The driver is a man a lot like you. He's out way too late last night, and might not have all his faculties about him. I nodded and stood up. The tall man called to me as I walked away. Au revoir, mon ami. The bus plowed right through the stop sign. He was right. The driver never saw me. The bus squealed to a halt too late, with me trapped underneath. I could smell my skin melting on the scalding undercarriage. The driver ran out and saw what he'd done. He turned away and vomited as the party rushed out of the bus to see what was happening. A pretty lady wearing a sash that read Bride saw me and dropped her tall green novelty drink. The last thing I heard was the screams of her and her bridesmaids. The woman in white walked towards me in a dreamy way that night. She held a dusty bottle with no label that was full of some kind of dark liquor. She stood in front of me and took a big pull from the bottle. With a look of disdain, she held the bottle out to me. I reached for it, but she pulled it away and spat the liquor in my face. She began chanting something in French Creole and walked around me in a circle, stopping periodically to tease me by holding the bottle out in front of her. Every time I reached for the bottle, she would pull it away, take another swig, and spit it back in my face. Her chanting continued in between her taunts. Finally, she stopped and stared at me with hatred. Time to wake up, fool, she said. It wasn't English, but I understood her. She took one more long pull from the bottle, blood beginning to dribble from between her lips, and spewed it back onto me. I shot up from my sleep and was horrified to find my face and chest covered in blood. I cleaned myself up and spent the rest of the day wandering aimlessly around my apartment. Eventually I headed out and walked around the corner until late into the night. The tall man would be waiting for me in the doorway or the window of a bar, always with a shot of rum held out for me. I just ignored him and walked on. Well after midnight, near the edge of the corner, I saw her waiting for me on a distant street corner. Last chance, mon cher, said the tall man from the doorway of a quiet bar. The bar was dark because it was closing up. It was hard to make out the details of his face, but it looked like he was wearing white paint in the shape of a crude skull. I took the offered shot and drank it down slowly, savoring the burn. 
She rounded the corner, and I followed. As I walked, I lost sight of her, but she would always be there when I turned a corner or a car passed by, just standing and staring at me from a distance. Eventually, I found myself walking next to the tall, white wall. An opening in the wall revealed a huge, ornate iron gate. I stopped at the gate, and it slowly swung open, creaking on its centuries-old hinges. Of course, back where this all began, the cemetery. My feet carried me down the boulevard of this miniature city of the dead. She was gone again, so I scanned the side alleys for her. I saw a flash of her white dress between the crumbling tombs, so I ventured deeper into the cemetery after her. She was waiting for me next to a tomb. The tall man stood with her. When I stopped in front of them, he turned and removed the name plaque from one of the open crypts. The stale air that billowed out smelled of musty decay. He bowed low and gestured me inside. I began to weep, but I still climbed in. I turned onto my back in the tight space and looked up. He smiled at me and said, It's been a pleasure, truly. He lifted the plaque back up and sealed me inside, covering me in sweet darkness. Finally, I can rest. It was 2001. I was attending a neighborhood potluck at the local park with my wife and our newborn son. Our friends were elated upon learning we'd had our first and would be meeting Ashton for the first time that day. Everyone fussed over him and the adorable circular birthmark beneath his left eye, debating which of us he looked more alike and how excited their kids were to have a new friend. There were about a dozen of us that occupied three picnic tables. We had three or four coolers, a whole spread of different platters and trays that covered an entire table, along with burgers and dogs cooking on two charcoal grills. My cross-street neighbor, Fred, grilled while everyone else talked, drank, and played games. Ashton lay in his carriage, which I parked in the shade of an oak tree next to the grills. I kept Fred company while he cooked, acting as a sort of sous chef and making sure his drink was always full. The park was particularly busy, and despite everything going on, I spotted someone who appeared to be watching our group, sitting alone at a picnic table about ten yards from our spot. His clothes were sketchy, black pants and a heavy-looking hoodie that obscured his face. They were so uncharacteristic for a midday barbecue and made him very noticeable. The hooded man sat facing us with his arms folded across the table. I pointed him out to Fred, who acknowledged that something seemed off but thought he appeared harmless. Maybe he's meeting someone, I suggested, while pouring Fred a beer. Without any discretion, Fred turned and stared directly at the man. Could be, Fred said, with disinterest, while flipping a few burgers. Maybe he got stood up. We'll fix him a plate and make him feel a little better. I rolled my eyes at Fred's remark, unable to resonate with his unapologetic apathy. I couldn't ignore my instincts that were telling me this guy was here for another reason. Nobody else seemed to notice or mind him, and I didn't want to put a damper on the gathering, so I kept quiet about my apprehension. Despite being unable to see much of his face, I definitely felt the man's looming gaze briefly lock onto mine for a few minutes. After convincing myself he didn't have any good intentions, I decided to confront this particular individual. Let me see what's up with this guy, I said softly to Fred. It's those newfound parental instincts kicking in, Fred said, they get a little wonky at first, just FYI. I started towards the man's table, but froze upon hearing an ear-splitting crack, a booming of shattering glass, and a crunching of metal. Everyone in the park stopped and stared at the parking lot, where a large tree limb had broken and smashed two cars. The hell! Fred exclaimed, as he set his spatula down and raced towards the scene. The tree limb had fallen onto Fred's car, which mine was parked next to, and partly covered by the massive branches. Throwing my arms up in the air, I released a what-the-hell of my own and followed behind Fred. Rachel was already assessing our cars when I arrived, shuddering upon spotting a few good-sized scratches and dents and a windshield crack. I expected Rachel to be as equally upset. Instead, she gave me a perplexed stare. Where's the baby? she quickly asked. 
I immediately pivoted, instantly noticing the hooded man had left his table and was beelining towards the grill. I broke into an all-out sprint upon determining the hooded man was after Ashton, releasing a boisterous, hey, that I hoped would deter him and get others' attention. What happened next took a matter of seconds, but felt like it unraveled in slow motion. The hooded man, wearing thick padded gloves, removed one of the grill's metal grates and grabbed its side handles. He turned to me once more before lifting the grill and dumping the red-hot coals into the carriage. A loud, hiss-like sizzle mixed with my baby's shrill, blood-curdling shriek, his screams only lasting two or three seconds before the carriage burst into flames. Grabbing handfuls of my hair, I reached Ashton's carriage. I could only scream his name and instantly knocked the stroller over with a firm kick. Glowing coals charred the blankets and pillows, and Ashton's smoldering remains spilled out most of which were still on fire. The hooded man took off across the field while being pursued by Fred and two others. I could instantly tell that my baby was dead, whose stiff, crumpled form was completely doused in flames and produced a burnt, meaty aroma that filled my nostrils. I heard my wife's hysterical screams behind me, and I felt my legs give out as I collapsed in a heap. Rachel was inconsolable, she had to be sedated by the paramedics. I faded in and out with most of time being between witnessing Ashton's murder and being taken to the hospital. It all felt like a blur. While waiting for an update on my wife, an officer came up to me and said they had caught the hooded man who initially escaped the park. I was brought to the police station where I first laid eyes on him through a one-way mirror. He sat in an interrogation room. The man's appearance was grotesque, and he had appalling physical deformities. His skin was a light pinkish beige and littered with veiny, blotchy gray and black growths. He was completely hairless and had dark yellow eyes, whose right one was about twice the size of his left. I was met with repulsion and a boiling fury while gazing upon this murderous subhuman life form whose windpipe I yearned to crush with my bare hand. After confirming I did not recognize him, detectives told me that he was being classified as a John Doe. The hooded man had no form of identification, wasn't showing up on any of the databases, and hadn't spoken a word. After getting assured that he wouldn't be released anytime soon, they asked a few more questions before letting me go, promising to provide updates on new developments. I returned to the hospital where Rachel was still being treated for severe mental breakdown. I spent the night in the waiting room, mostly with my face buried in my cupped hands, replaying the day's grisly, life-altering events in my head. At some point, I dozed off and was awoken the next morning by a nurse. She brought me to the doctor caring for Rachel, who said my wife was in a deep state of catatonia. After being updated on Rachel's condition, I returned home to start arranging Ashton's services. No sooner than taking three steps out of the hospital, however, I was stopped by the same officer who'd brought me to the police station yesterday. He looked distraught, and I could tell he was dreading what he was about to tell me. He's gone, the officer said sorrowfully. Who's gone? I asked with bewilderment. The man who killed your baby. He somehow escaped last night. No witnesses, nothing on the camera, no sign of how. He was in his cell one minute and just gone the next. The hooded man was never found. Rachel made little progress overcoming her debilitating trauma, spending the next year in and out of psychiatric care. My life consisted of work, visiting her at the hospital, and going to bed. Two months passed, during which things continued to gradually implode. Rachel returned home, but was on a cocktail of meds that barely seemed to help. She became a bitter, hostile shell of her former self, barely capable of functioning independently, and prone to sporadic fits of rage, delirium, or emotional episodes. Rachel blamed me for our baby's death, and made it her mission to keep me constantly reminded. I reached my breaking point with Rachel, when she used a broken bottle to attack me during one of her episodes, slicing my arm and neck, which required over a dozen stitches. After that, Rachel was put into the mental care facility, and I decided to explore my legal options for ending our marriage. 
She could be looked after by her family, I thought. Most of them also hated and blamed me for Ashton's death anyway, even saying I was responsible for Rachel's mental breakdown. My boss's wife connected me with a divorce attorney to look at my case. When I met him at his office, however, he said something that took me completely off guard. I've actually been expecting you, Mr. Williard, the attorney said while rummaging through his desk. I have something here with instructions that I'm to give you on the 1st of September, which is today. He slid a yellow manila envelope in front of me, which had my name in large black letters. Inside was a light gray envelope that also had my name handwritten on it in red ink. Who did it come from? I asked awkwardly. I only spoke to him twice. One year ago when he initially called, and then last night when he reminded me about today. He just identified himself as Mr. Doe. Sent me a large wad of cash to hold this for him, and that was that. Didn't ask any questions. That's sometimes how it goes in my business. The envelope's letter contained a vertical list of numbers, with other sets of digits, words, or letters beneath each one. The manila envelope held a white CD with Watch in Order written across its surface. I didn't even accomplish what I had come there to do originally becoming completely sidetracked by this mysterious package. I ran the CD on my computer, which had a handful of video files labeled 1 through 5, remembering the disc said, Watch in Order. I opened the first file, and my heart stopped when the video began playing. Appearing on the screen was the deformed face of my baby's killer. The man who murdered my baby sat in a concrete room, wearing the same heavy hoodie and black stretch pants as he had that day. I would have pulled my computer off the desk and thrown it across the room if the shock of seeing his hideous face hadn't numbed me into a state of borderline paralysis. After fiddling with the camera, the hooded man leaned back and stared intently into the lens. I'm so sorry, Jeremy he said in a low, gruff voice, causing sharp chills to race down my spine when he spoke my name. I really am so very sorry for everything, but you must understand why this happened. Let me start from the beginning. I took a sharp breath and struggled to maintain my composure, but felt compelled to continue watching. My name obviously isn't Mr. Doe. It's Eric and I'm from the year 2076. I know that sounds absurd, but you have something that will prove I'm telling the truth, which I'll cover in a little bit. The man who identified himself as Eric leaned closer towards the camera. You know this was for a greater good, and doing this actually saved countless lives. I leaned back and stared skeptically at the computer screen, my intensifying hatred for this man clashing with the queasy uneasiness ushered in when he admitted to being the Mr. Doe from whom I received the package. Okay, now that I've got your attention, here's where it gets complicated, Eric continued. Some years from now, I can't get into specifics, a catastrophe is going to occur that devastates the world. Among the most adverse ramifications are a series of physical mutations that a portion of the population will undergo. As you can clearly see, Eric gestured toward his deformed face, were known as defects and require special treatment to stay alive, like routine radiation doses and staying within certain temperature ranges, just to mention a few. Cases of radiation contamination and new disease outbreak originating from defects turn us into pariahs, this is where your son comes in. During these times, we call Ashton Williams the Demachiant. He was a renowned public figure whose faction quickly rose to power in the Cataclysm's aftermath, feeding off people's manipulatable emotions and fear. Seeking a scapegoat amidst their promise of rebuilding, the Demache, as his minions are called, set their sights on the defects. They succeeded in generating enough widespread hatred amongst us, 
even going so far as to stage violent attacks and pinning us as the culprits. The video made me completely enraged. The Demachiant cited their attacks and our susceptibility to infect and contaminate people as grounds to start rounding us up into containment camps. We knew the risks we posed towards unaffected portion of the population and took great pains to isolate and care for ourselves. While researchers worked tirelessly to discover a cure, they actually came close, but the programs were discontinued without explanation. The camps had inhumane conditions. Many died from disease or malnourishment before the Dimashe began extermination. The things they did would make history's most heinous figures cringe. You'll see what I mean when you watch the other files. I lost everything in those camps, Jeremy. Doing this was the only way to reverse that, and in the end, the Demachiant's oppressive reign. I felt a lump form in my throat and held back tears, simultaneously empathizing with Eric, while still reluctant to believe his stories. Your son was ravenous for power. The Demachias evasively occupied territory, eventually starting a multinational war. They killed millions of defects, but those numbers pale in comparison to the tens of thousands of people who perished just in the war alone. A few tears streamed down Eric's face as he spoke. It's okay to talk about what your son would have become since that timeline is being eliminated. As for why I killed him in such a gruesome manner, doing it at that exact moment and way was the only option to stably alter the timeline. My heart sank when I recalled that fateful day, particularly when the tree limb fell on my car. It was the perfect distraction. Did Eric know that would happen? Did he change time to make that branch break, knowing how immediately it would occupy my attention? Jeremy, I know you're probably having a hard time believing this. I would too, but think about how I just vanished from my cell. I'd love to explain how it works, but... It's against the rules to directly reveal certain information. That's why I sent you this. There's clues for events that will occur in the future, which will verify this is very real. Think of it as a puzzle. It's actually quite easy once you figure it out. There's some considerable time between each instance, but don't worry. I'll send you reminders. I know you're hurt, confused, and angry right now, but please believe me when I say... A great loss or tragedy is sometimes necessary to prevent something much, much worse from happening. After the video ended, I stared at the computer for what felt like hours. Tearing, perspiring, and trembling, I had no idea what to believe. After collecting myself, I watched the other videos, which were compilations of newspaper clippings, excerpts from news broadcasts, and raw footage depicting scenes of war and unfathomable carnage. They seemed to map out everything Eric described, mentioning the cataclysm, the defects, the Demache rise to power, and their imperialistic campaign. Headlines such as, Experts Recovery Will Take Years, Over 10K New Mutation Cases Confirmed, Link Between Defects and Contamination Outbreak Identified, and... Dimash complete southern coastal occupation caught my eye. While videos and pictures flashed on the screen that Eric's words did little justice in describing, I saw images of war-torn horizons and crumbling city skylines, explosions, scores of marching fighting soldiers, along with dead and dismembered bodies. The most disturbing scene showed defects performing hard labor, Rooms with their bodies and severed limbs hanging from meat hooks. Mass executions and graves. Even some getting their deformities cut off or experimented on while they were still conscious. It didn't take long for me to deduce a robust, prominent-looking man donning black authoritative uniforms and a long overcoat, who I saw clips of making fiery speeches getting paraded around while waving to the crowd, speaking with officers, other official-looking individuals, and transported by armed security detail. It, it was my son. Despite having his mother's eyes, 
Ashton bore an overwhelmingly striking resemblance to me, but what verified my son's identity without a shadow of a doubt was the birthmark still visible beneath his left eye. Despite the macabre prospects of the future, I was intensely proud of my son, which I suppose comes natural for any parent, until reminding myself that he would have turned into, into a genocidal warlord whose totalitarian regime appeared to deepen the world's state of ruin. I stopped watching after one scene of Ashton making a passionate speech when I noticed an elderly man and woman sitting in the background. They were huddled together and gazed upon Ashton, their faces containing conflicted expressions of admiration and obligatory supportiveness, along with disappointment, concern, and dismay. My jaw dropped, and I released a gasp-like yelp before abruptly closing the video. Rachel and I were that elderly couple. Experiencing a wave of smothering lightheadedness, I tried pouring myself a drink only to violently regurgitate it while standing over the sink. Those videos looked so genuine, and I hated how everything Eric said was making sense. Had my son really been destined to become this monstrous tyrant? Was this some elaborate sadistic prank a deranged individual was orchestrating to gain pleasure at the expense of my suffering? I tried thinking of every conceivable explanation to not believe, but I couldn't be convinced. My attention shifted to the notes, series of numbers that meant nothing upon review. Remembering what Eric said, to think of it as a puzzle, I looked at the first set of characters. 9, 112, 1, 11, 77, 175, 93. What are you trying to tell me, I asked. This must be something more to this. About one week later, I received an identical light gray envelope in the mail. It contained a handwritten letter, also in red ink, that simply read... 9112001 just reminding you i spent weeks trying to crack the cryptic code which consumed me for months to no avail it would take me over 3 years to finally figure it out when the next letter arrived after finalizing my divorce with rachel i moved back to my home state and reconnected with an old high school sweetheart we got engaged were starting our own company and in the process of purchasing a house I was grateful to finally move on with my life, but despite getting closure on Ashton's death, I still kept the indecipherable letters. Christmas was five days away, and I returned home from gift shopping where I found another light gray envelope lying on my doormat. Despite immediately knowing what it was, the envelope's mere sight flooded my mind with memories of Ashton's screams, his burning carriage, and Eric's undeniable face. I shakingly opened the envelope to find another letter, which read, 12262004. Do you believe me yet? On the first letter, written 12262004, were the numbers 75891. This time around, however, I was more concerned Eric knew where I lived than solving this mystery. I was about to dial 911, but remembered when Eric said that he was sending me reminders and decided to play along, feeling certain this letter was the latest. I figured everything out on the date later, ironically while writing a final check to my divorce lawyer. It was the day after Christmas, and I had the news on while paying some bills. They were talking about a massive earthquake and tsunami that devastated coastal communities around the Indian Ocean. I was so distracted by the story I almost put the comma of the check's numerical amount in the wrong spot. While stopping myself, I looked at the check's date, which read December 26, 2004. Remembering I was anticipating something significant to happen, I grabbed the open letter and stared closely at the numbers. 12262004. Thinking about the mistake I almost made on the check, I rewrote the figure and shifted the second comma one digit to the left, so it read 1226-2004. I did the same with the top number, going from 9112 
9-11-2001 to 9-11-2001, which was when it became clear. They were dates. It was something the news anchor said that I happened to hear. The earthquake registered a 9.1 on the Richter scale. That drew my stare to the number beneath, 12, 26, 2004, which were 758 and 91. Then it came to me. 91 signified the earthquake's magnitude. I learned the quake happened at 7.58 a.m. local time, which I linked to the other number, 758. Solving 9112001 figures was even more unsettling. The date it translated to was obvious, and after doing some research, I deduced the other figures represented the first number of each aircraft involved. I started shaking when the reality of the revelation hit me, almost having a serious breakdown when I couldn't fathom any other way that Eric or whoever it was could have known this information. My perception of reality, space, and time was turning upside down, marking a day which forever changed my life. I still resent Eric for killing my baby, and I will always keep Ashton's memory alive, because I remember him as an adorable innocent child who hadn't hurt or wronged a single soul. Having said that, I finally understand what Eric meant. I translated the last three numbers, 34, 2, 0, 1, 1, 2 became March 4th, 2012. 842-020 0, turned into August 4th, 2020. And 4 132 029 was April 13th, 2029. Despite the tragic nature of the events that already happened, I understood why Eric chose them specifically. They mostly happened by pure chance, and could not have been predicted or prevented. Having said that, I've spent the last 15 years making vain efforts at determining what happens on each of those dates before the event unfolds, with hopes of preventing the tragedy. As expected, I received my next letter over seven years later in a late winter of 2012. 342 012. I know you don't need the reminders anymore but I sent this one just in case, was what it read. Under 342-012 on the original letter, I received over a decade ago, 700-UTC and capital were written. On March 4th, 2012, a series of deadly explosions caused by an arms dump rocked Brazzaville, capital city of the Republic of the Congo. The blast started around 8 a.m. local time, which translated to 7 o'clock Coordinated Universal Time, otherwise known as UTC. That made sense. The most recent event happened this past summer. The next letter arrived the last week of July, which said, 842-020. See you soon. Don't do anything stupid. I'll be watching. I obsessed over this and what it might mean, unsure how it pertained to the next event I expected to occur on August 4th. Beneath 842-020 on the original letter were the terms NH4903 and port, whose meaning I could only speculate until the actual event transpired. I'm sure most of us remember the explosion that happened in Beirut, Lebanon. Port signified where the blast happened, a port in Beirut. This one took me a while, but I figured out NH4N03 was the chemical formula for ammonium nitrate, which caused the deadly explosion. There's a good amount of time between now and the last event, which should be on April 13th, 2029. After translating it from a numerical figure of 4132029, beneath it on the original letter that I still have after all these years, the phrase... 1997XF11 and skin are written. I have no idea what they foreshadowed, and I probably won't know until the actual day. I've kept this knowledge of the future away from my then fiance, who's my now wife of 14 years. We have a thriving company under us, along with a home and two beautiful children. The letters and their connection to Ashton's death are tied to a completely different part of my past that my family was not involved in 
and has no knowledge of, and I intend to keep it that way, until we met our new neighbor. They were a very nice couple from the Northwest that relocated for the husband, Corey's job. They have one child who's around the same age as my own kids, and they get along famously, along with a two-month-old baby boy. Looking back, I think I understand now what the most recent letter I received meant. The name of my neighbor's newborn is Eric. The recent trend in tiny house building intrigued me. Everything from turning a shed into a home, a shipping container, or even a van fascinated me. The way so many of these people moved out of city living and into isolated living off the land by growing their own food in gardens made from recycled materials had me wondering if I could do something like that. I recently broke it off with my girlfriend and wanted to move out of the city. One too many break-ins, nasty bouts with slumlords, and the general consensus that the world seemed to be broken made me long for a simpler life. I decided to take a risk and try it for myself. I felt intrigued about suitable land that allowed for city water and electrical hookups. My friend Micah referred me to reach out to a friend's father, Dave. I knew that he had loads of property in the wooded areas not far out of Columbus. The gentleman in question often allowed campers to rent his land for scenic nature experiences. He made a lot of money in the summer months, but would he be interested in letting me rent and build a house on his property? I got his number from my friend and called to discuss it with him. Yellow. Hey, my name's Kurt. I was referred to you by Micah Ashley regarding some rental property that you might have available. Micah, you say? Yeah, he's my friend. Good guy. I got a spot. What did you want to do? We talking camping for a weekend or a week? I'm actually looking for an area that I can rent to build on. I'm trying to downsize and I was told you might be someone to reach out to. There was a long silence, and I had to look at the phone to make sure he hadn't just hung up on me. Yeah, I got a place. You can come meet me tomorrow, and I'll give you the tour of the property. Then we can discuss payment. The next day, I met Dave on the property. We discussed what I wanted to do, make a home on the land and pay monthly rent. He seemed eager to rent the property to me, but there was a stipulation. I need the full year's rent up front, and you can do whatever you like out here. I only ask that you're quiet as the horses get spooked easily. I thought about it and then finally agreed. Dave said he would even help me get in contact with a contractor, one of his buddies. The cost was more than I had anticipated, but it was worth it. I was going to own my own home and nearly 10 acres of land with only one neighbor. I was also given free reign on how I wanted to construct. So, as promised, my journey began. I found one of those shipping containers on eBay from a guy in Pennsylvania who was selling it for about 650 bucks. I just had to pay to haul it back. Once again, I was assisted by Dave, who just so happened to have a truck to haul it. It was nice to be living so close to a guy that was so kind. I set up close to the unit and began working on the interior immediately. I didn't make it to have a ton of extra fixtures. I was mainly going for a couple of windows, a bed, a space to store my things. The contractor that Dave sent me was a good guy, and he helped me with the design, but I put everything together. I'm proud of what I came up with. There were a few things I didn't expect, one of which that I could get running water, but the toilet wouldn't flush as well as I liked it. I almost decided on a composite toilet. Still, Dave said that of all the things, he could not allow the dumping of any kind on his property. Nor did he want me creating a large garden bed, which seemed odd to me because he'd been so cool about everything else. So that meant the composite garden was out unless I grew these things in a box on my makeshift patio. So, after a few months, I was settling in. When they said that nature was healing, they didn't lie. I spent most of my time working and sitting on my new deck. It was peaceful and calming. It wasn't long after the first month that I noticed something about my new tiny house. While it was exactly like the ones you see on those home and garden style TV shows, there was just something that began to make me feel uneasy. I woke up one morning to the sound of my shower running. When I got out of bed, I could have sworn I saw someone running out my side door that led to the new patio. I never jumped out of bed so fast. 
I ran to the door and saw nothing where I should have seen someone running away. I called Dave that very morning after the sun came up. I asked him if he'd seen anyone on the property. He said he'd check his security cameras, which he did while I was talking to him. Dave said he couldn't see anything unusual, and I was more than welcome to check them myself. He even offered to install one for me. Again, he was a guy that was nice and polite, yet I opted not to take him up on the offer. Instead, I decided to install my own. I got one that required a phone app and had infrared availability. I still need to get it delivered to my new residence. Instead, I had the new camera delivered to my post office box that I set up when I moved in. Once I installed it, I could do nothing but wait. I ended up waiting about a week or so, but there was nothing. Perhaps I was just losing my mind. Maybe what I had seen that morning was just me dreaming. That would have explained what I saw. I was sleeping when the second instance occurred. I was dead to the world when something woke me up. It was my phone. My cell had several notifications from the camera app. I sat up in bed and clicked on the first one. All I could see was what looked like two eyes that appeared off the deck of my tiny house. I skipped past it, assuming that it was just a deer. Second notification was that of a shadow, but I couldn't make out what it was. The third notification, I clicked on it, and there was nothing there. I clicked on the last one, and it was completely black. I was annoyed, but I went back to sleep. The next day, I had to go into town for work. We had some big meetings that required me to show up in person. I sat in the large auditorium, taking notes from the CEO about security changes that we had to make on our work computers. I was trying to pay attention when my phone dinged. I looked down, and there was another notification from the camera app. This time, I saw what looked like a woman with shaggy hair and hardly any clothes on. She was standing, staring at my patio door. She wasn't moving. She just stood there. Within a few minutes, she had moved closer, but... I didn't see her walk. She just appeared. Then in the background, it looked like something or someone was standing behind her. At that point, the camera went black. I can't tell you the feeling I got from watching her. I didn't know if she was flesh and blood or a ghost or what she was. I drove home after my meeting in a state of panic. I was concerned with my safety, but also wondering if I was overreacting. It could have just been a curious camper from one of Dave's other rentals. I pulled onto the property and saw Dave, waving at me as I drove past him towards the drive next to my newly created tiny house. That's when I saw something strange. One of the planter boxes I had set up on the patio railing, which had some herbs in it, had been knocked over. I picked it up and cleaned it up as best I could. I noticed someone standing behind me and turned to see Dave shaking his head. Looks like we got raccoons. We got to be careful when we plant things. This is why I said no gardens. Can't tell you the number of times we tried, but the missus and I never got anything to take. We tried setting fences, but whatever lives around here always got in. I thanked Dave and watched him go back inside his own house. I placed the planter box back on the deck rail, hoping it would stay put this time. That's when I noticed something else. There was what looked like a hole under my new house. Could it be an animal? I'd have to set a few traps and relocate whatever it was. I certainly didn't need an infestation of groundhogs or rabbits. I put my briefcase inside the house, locked the door, and went to take a shower. I was standing in the shower for a while when the water suddenly shut off on me. What the hell? I grabbed a towel and went to investigate. When I went to look outside to see what could have stopped the water, I saw a man standing on my deck wasn't just any man. It was Dave, and only he didn't look like himself. He looked disheveled and broken, with a furious expression on his face. Hey Dave, everything okay? The water shut off, I said as I stood there half naked. Dave didn't say anything. He walked around the other side of the house, and when I went to follow him, he disappeared. Like, completely disappeared. I'm not sure what to make of it. The water came back on a second later when I walked into the house. I felt awful for pissing Dave off, only something didn't feel right. I was driving into town the next day, and I stopped to talk to him while he was carrying some feed to the cows. Just wanted to apologize for anything I could have done to make you angry, I said, looking at him. 
Dave just stared at me, puzzled. Sorry, I don't think you've ever done anything disrespectful. You pay your utilities, you take care of things around here, you've paid your rent for the next ten months. You must be mistaken. Nah, I mean, when the water shut off, you stood on my porch and you looked pretty pissed. Kurt, I got no idea what you're talking about. Now it was my turn to be puzzled. I have no idea what I'm supposed to think. Could Dave have multiple personalities? Does he black out on a regular? I don't believe that's the case. I don't really know where to go from here. I'm not terrified, but after my conversation with Dave last night, I was awoken again by the app on my phone. At that very minute, it gave me a live feed of that woman standing outside. Still, when I looked at the patio, there was nobody there. The next day, I noticed that the hole near my patio had gotten bigger. That was about three weeks ago. And so far, no new weirdness has occurred. I'm not sure what to think. If anything new happens, I'll be sure to write about it. I was doing okay these last few weeks, but weird things began to happen again over the previous weekend. I had primarily been busy at work. If anything had been going on, I wouldn't have even noticed it. We were working on a new hologram system for a gaming program at work. I helped develop security for online players once it went live, so much of my time was devoted to the new project. I needed a break, so I went to my buddy's birthday extravaganza in Auburn. I'd be out of town for the weekend, bonding with old friends. While I was away, I kept getting hits on my camera app. Nothing too upsetting. Most of the things I got were notifications about deer and birds, and on occasions I'd see Dave's truck driving by from a distance. Also not unusual. He had to haul feed to the cows and goats on the other end of the property. On my last night in Auburn, I woke up shortly after midnight. My camera app had over 20 notifications in two minutes. I didn't even know something like that was possible. Yet, here we are. When I clicked on the first notification, it was pitch black. Nothing too alarming, but when I began clicking on the third, fourth, and fifth, a ball of light kept getting closer to the camera with each shot. The last notification I selected was of a blue orb that looked like a figure. I couldn't make out what it was, though. I showed my buddy the next day, but I didn't tell him anything about the previous weird occurrences, and he suggested that it was ball lightning. I thought about it and decided he was probably right. It was nothing I couldn't explain. Later that afternoon, when I arrived home to my tiny house, I found nothing around the property that appeared off. I saw Dave coming up the driveway, and he waved as he always did when I got home. I decided then that I had an idea. I ran up to Dave just as I got out of the truck. Dave, remember when you told me that I could look at your security camera footage? Would it be alright if I looked at it from earlier this morning? Dave looked puzzled, but agreed. We went into the small farmhouse, and his wife, Margaret, offered me coffee. I politely declined, and we went into his office to view the footage. He sat down at his computer, moved some things around, and then opened one of the browsers. He clicked on the most recent footage he had uploaded and let me sit at his desk and browse through it. Feel free to take as long as you like. Are you still having issues up there? Well, I'm not sure if I have any answers, but something popped up on my security footage this morning. I want to compare it to what you have. I didn't detect any dishonesty in Dave. He seemed to genuinely be concerned. I looked at the footage, but when I got to the footage from around midnight... I couldn't see anything that my camera had picked up. No ball lightning, no car lights, nobody in my yard flashing any lights at all. It was all extraordinary. I got up, thanked Dave for his kindness again, and retreated home. I hesitated before entering my house. I looked down, and that hole had gotten bigger. I unlocked my door and tossed my bag inside and then inspected the hole. It was practically big enough for a grown man to fit in. It didn't appear deep enough to go anywhere. It was just a two-foot deep hole. I called Dave and asked him to come have a look. When he got there, 
He did what one of you suggested. We filled it back in. Dave apologized and said he would put out some groundhog traps that afternoon. He was so matter-of-fact, I figured he'd dealt with this sort of thing before. Once we filled in the hole, Dave put in some garden stone boulders. They were not too sizable, but heavy enough to keep a groundhog out. I thanked him once again. I went inside and decided to relax. I closed my blinds and drew my TV screen down from the ceiling and turned on my mini projector to watch a movie. I was watching some action flick about a maniacal terrorist when suddenly I heard something hit the window behind my head. I pulled the blinds up and looked outside, but there was nothing there. After a few minutes of me looking around, I saw it. Hundreds of birds began to drop from the sky, hitting my tiny house and landing several feet in the yard. I got up and pulled up my projection screen and went outside. I looked around and then looked up. Something was above my tiny house. I couldn't see anything except the sky, but something was cloaked as every bird flying over hit that very something and fell to the ground. I looked down and saw that all the boulders were now moved. Now, I'm no believer in alien abduction. I've never seen any so-called UFOs. Yet, something was going on out here. Dave came running out of his house, perplexed about the birds flying over, and why there were so many of them. It was about an hour when all of a sudden, it stopped as suddenly as it began. Dave called a wildlife officer to come and investigate the possibility of a potential disease, but after the officer inspected the birds, there were no signs of infection. They had all died from broken necks. More puzzled than frightened, I returned to my tiny house. I locked the door and went to lie down. It was dark out now, and the stars had come out. The place was beautiful. I hated that the beauty of it made me wish to stay forever, yet I knew even then about the seven-month lease on the house. I would in no way be able to remain in my tiny house. I didn't even want my money back. I thought of subletting it to someone or using it as an Airbnb to cover the cost that I'd put into it. Then, the final and last straw broke the camel's back. I'd close my eyes when my camera app went off again. When I looked at it, I could see that same woman from before in the camera. She was at my door. This time when I saw her, all my anger and fear got the better of me. I ran to the door and flung it open. What the fuck do you want? Sorry about my language, I don't usually curse, but I was pretty angry. The woman was there this time, but there was something about her eyes. Something that I couldn't even articulate. They glowed. I can't explain it, but they friggin' glowed. She looked at me under my porch light and put a finger to her lips. Then she slipped back into the night. I tried to follow her, and that was when I saw her go towards the hole in the ground and crawl in. And as she faded into the hole... All I could see was her eyes before there was nothing. The light in them disappeared. I jumped off my porch in a frenzy and went towards the hole. It was only when I tried to follow her that I noticed that the hole was only a couple of feet deep. Where could she have gone? There was no way she could have fit inside it. The following day, I packed my things and went to my parents. Not something you really care to do in your mid-thirties, but... I felt I would lose my mind if I didn't leave. Dave was completely understanding. I told him I would figure out something with the tiny house. I could sell it and probably get the money I'd put into it back. Let Dave use it as an Airbnb property. Until I figure out what I want to do, I'd be at my parents indefinitely. My mom put me in my old bedroom. My dad offered me his advice, but when I told him about everything... He looked like a man who'd figured his son had a nervous breakdown. Maybe it was all in my head. I was hoping for that, but there's one thing I can't explain. Why does my camera app still send me those damn notifications with the woman? She's standing under the camera with those eyes and beckoning me to come with her. I've been overworked and exhausted, and I was sure there was a reasonable explanation. When I showed my dad the videos... He seemed to be more concerned about the young woman's safety. 
couldn't seem to express to him the fear that I had every time I looked at her face. It was as if she didn't show herself to others the way she did to me. Also, how do you explain that force field over my house? Dave's doppelganger? All the weird stuff going on that had me unnerved? I went to a doctor to get sleeping medication. I deactivated the camera app from my phone as well. I felt a bit better these last few days, for the most part, now that I haven't had to worry about it for the last couple of days. Then last night, I got an update on my work email. It was regarding a system breach with the security program. I noticed something strange when I clicked on the information to decipher where the breach had occurred so I could begin to fix it. The new gaming system had photos that resembled my tiny house. In the video game, players could activate the hologram application to appear in any room in any place or building they chose. Only, the hologram would utilize the same space it was in. It would work similarly to the Oculus, only goggles weren't necessary because the hologram worked with the area you activated it. You select the hologram to appear in your display area, like your bedroom, living room, or your office. So if you wanted to watch a killer character act out his rage, or if you wanted to play the character yourself, you would be in the room with them. They also could react to you. It would be like they were in there with you, only the hologram in this game wasn't your typical killer or action figure. It was now introducing a new character, that disheveled woman I kept seeing in front of my tiny house. I know this sounds crazy. Technology is crazy. There's still a lot of bugs in this new gaming system. We only have a few prototypes, so it hasn't made it to the public yet. I shouldn't even be telling any of you about this. I need to tell someone about it, though, because I don't know what to do. Something's using it. I asked my boss if we could shut down the program for the time being until all the bug fixes are complete. He thinks that's a good idea, but only gives me a month or two to fix these issues. I'm no longer in the tiny house. But the other day, I noticed something else when I was working on some integration. Several viruses were not detected in the game previously. I can't understand the language because it isn't your typical syntax type system. It's something I've never seen. It's as if the game has a mind of its own. Here is the real kicker. One of the latest characters in the hologram game looks exactly like me. Looks like I'm going to be tired for the near future, working around the clock trying to understand what's happening. Wish me luck. I know what you must be thinking. What a horrible person. I know. I've thought it too. The fact I'm genuinely thinking about sending away my dog makes me feel pretty guilty. Then I remember what he's been doing, and my guilt is replaced with fear. This started about a month ago. I came home early from work one day, absolutely furious, and clutching a parting gift from my boss. My Christmas bonus was a ham or something. I sighed with a hand pressed firmly against my throbbing temple and placed the mystery meat in the fridge. The pounding behind my eyes got more and more intense until I leveled my fist and punched the fridge. The throbbing in my head didn't go away, but there was a new guest as it was now accompanied by the pain in my knuckles. I let out a deep sigh that was childish. It was... At that moment that Rufus came padding in, his big brown eyes gazing up at me, as if wondering what that noise had been. <laughs> Your dad was pretty dumb just now, I said, crouching down to run my hands across his thick fur. He wagged his tail and let out an excited noise as I petted him. I raised my eyebrows. I wish I could just curl up in a ball and chill like you do. Rufus, of course, paid no mind to this, and after realizing he wouldn't be receiving more pets, padded away back to his comfortable bed. I rolled my eyes and took a deep breath. While disappointing, this whole Christmas bonus thing wasn't the end of the world. Sure, my boss was an evil prick, but I had a whole two weeks of paid vacation stored up, and he couldn't stop me from using it. So, screw him. 
I'm going to relax and spend my vacation doing whatever I want. How about it, Rufus? Want to do nothing? I asked loudly. Rufus simply yawned. It was the next morning that I discovered that the mystery meat was still in my fridge. I peeled back the wrapped paper to see a red mass bundled in saran wrap. I furrowed my brow. Gotta be beef. Rufus sat at my side, eagerly waiting. I'm not a butcher. How would I know what it is? I'll just... fry it? Everything tastes good fried with onions. I leaned down and booped Rufus's snoot. I bet you would taste good fried with onions, too. He agreed as his tail wagged back and forth. Well, don't you have a high opinion of yourself? I cut off a large chunk of the mystery meat and threw it in a pan with onions, salt, pepper, and butter. I hope you taste good, Christmas bonus, because you don't really look that great. <laughs> I probably talk to myself too much. Having a full conversation probably isn't healthy. I raised my eyebrow and decided to turn on the TV for my own sanity. It blinked on to a cooking channel. I glared at the TV. Don't you shame me. Then I flipped to the news and got right back to frying the beef. Thoughts and prayers go out to the victims and families of the late... I looked down at the large mass of beef left over. Hey Rufus, I picked up a raw slab. Want something to chew on? He dashed on over like any dog would when presented with a hunk of meat. All right, you want it? Sit, I commanded with my most authoritative voice. Rufus gave no care, lunging upward and snagging it from my hand. Hey, I said laughing, that was rude. Rufus took one last look at me before tearing into the beef with vigor. Still chuckling to myself, I once again turned back to the news. The search is still on for Maya Kelling, a local who was reported missing on December 14th by her boyfriend. She was in the Beluva area, and anyone with information is encouraged to call this number. I shut it off. The news is so depressing. Rufus paid me no mind, as he continued munching away with that playful ferocity of a domesticated animal. I took a deep breath and went to have a smell of the beef. It smelled god-awful. Jesus, what did I do to this thing? There was something deeply off-putting about that smell. It didn't smell rotten or decayed. It smelled... foreign. It filled me with apprehension and a strange sense of dread. I shook my head and felt a wave of stupidity roll over me. The feeling was not too dissimilar when you were watching a scary YouTube video at night by yourself and you want to turn the lights on. I felt like a little bitch, but the feeling of nervousness and the fact that no one but me would judge me for throwing all this meat out made my decision easy. This was going straight into the garbage. I threw it in and did my utmost to forget about it. Take out it is. Having stuffed myself with pizza, I crashed hard. I'm a heavy sleeper, so it takes a lot to wake me up. Yet, I was woken up. A loud crash echoed through my bedroom as I shot bolt upright and listened for a moment. I heard dragging noises. My heart pounded in my chest. I stood, having armed myself with my pistol, I took a couple of careful steps forward. The noise became more distinguished. There was a gnawing and an eager snort. A sense of dread filled me as I rounded the corner, expecting the worse. Rufus! I shouted seeing an absolutely devastating mess. He had torn open the trash, and it was scattered everywhere. I groaned and slumped my shoulders. Not only did you scare the crap out of me, I'm also going to have to clean up your friggin' mess. Come on, man. Rufus had pillaged what he was looking for and scampered off without even looking at me. Having fully cleaned up the mess, I stood up and stretched, cracking my back in a few places. You're an ass for that, I said as I washed my hands. I'm going back to bed. Good night. Love you, I trailed off. Rufus was sitting on his bed, gnawing on something. Hey, what do you have there? I walked forward and reached down. To my great surprise, it was the first time I was greeted by a low growl. Hey now, I said, my words barely making it out of my throat because of the immediate surprise and fear. I took a few steps back and 
knelt down to get a good view of what he was gnawing on. The mystery meat. I reached forward tentatively and got met with the same low growl as before. Rufus, come on, give me that. I think it's bad. But what Rufus did next sent a chill down my spine. He simply stopped gnawing on it and stared me dead in my eyes. No more movement. No tail wagging. Nothing. I must have sat there for 30 seconds before I did anything. I stood up, forcing myself to turn around despite every single fiber of my being telling me not to take my eyes off of him. Fine. Have it your way. I couldn't help but take a peek over my shoulder as I walked away. He sat motionless, his eyes still locked onto mine. I turned on my light and closed my door, lying in bed until my eyes got too heavy to keep open. After waking up, it took a few seconds to recollect the night before. When I did, I fully opened my door to reveal Rufus curled up in a ball. He was curled up in his dog bed, fast asleep. I felt the weary tension within me wither away. I need to get out of the house, I muttered. I came home that night to a dark abode. Having been drinking, my bearings were slightly askew, and I found myself fumbling with my keys a bit. As I pushed open the door to my house, I was greeted by an unfriendly darkness that settled itself over an empty house. I pawed for the light switch for a moment, until I found it flipping it on with my one hand. Crap! I cried in fear as my gaze was met by a great black mass standing in the middle of the living room. It wobbled slightly as if unsure of its footing before it fell to all fours. Rufus? I cried, my heart playing in my ribcage like a bongo. What, what the hell were you doing, you creepy ass mutt? Rufus just stared, tail stationary, eyes fixated on me. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go relax. Cut that out. Rufus didn't blink. Neither did I. I slammed my door closed and sat on the edge of my bed, taken aback. Jesus, that was friggin' scary. As I took off my shoes, the image of the shadows in the dark, form stretched in a way it wasn't supposed to, made my skin crawl. I've seen dogs standing up before, but in that goofy cute way hell i've even seen dogs do a headstand but this standing in the middle of the room in the dark just staring at the door it unsettled me to my core my sleep was troubled as if i had a nightmare i couldn't quite remember i woke up to that feeling of unease creeping its way back up my spine to stall i scrolled through the news but nothing could take my mind off of it not bitcoin plunging in value not the disappearance of that local girl. Not Taco Bell bringing back the nacho fries. I just kept imagining what Rufus must be doing at any given moment. Standing there. Just standing there. I growled and punched my pillow. I'm acting like a wuss. Gotta get up. I rolled out of bed and crept to my door, heart pounding. I stared at the handle and reached my hand out slowly my heart beginning to thump against my chest at an increased tempo, with a deep breath that caught in my chest as I eased the door open. I felt fear jolt through my body as I saw him, standing once again in the middle of the living room, his furry back to me as he stood absolutely motionless staring at the wall. My words caught in my throat before I could speak. I did the worst possible thing I could have possibly done, and quietly closed the bedroom door. The fear began to set in worse. I locked my door and collapsed on my bed, breathing fast. He was out there, standing upright. I couldn't open that door again. I couldn't make it out of the house. Not with him there. Not with him just standing there. I found myself nauseous with terror that had possessed my body. I sat there staring at the door for the better part of an hour before finally getting up the courage to once again check outside. I crept closer, each footfall on the soft carpet surely giving me away to the keen ears of Rufus. 
My heart pounded in near apoplectic terror as I once again laid my hands on the knob. It took me longer than I liked to admit to open the door. Once it did, I peered through the crack to try and see where he might be. Still standing. Trying my best to summon fury, I opened the door wide and shouted, Rufus! All the anger I summoned was turned into terror vapors when Rufus slowly turned his head to face me. He turned his body next. He took a step. He took another one. And another. I screamed in horror as he began marching towards me, off kilter, one step at a time. I once more slammed the door and locked it, stumbling backwards in panic. I didn't hear a sound at my door, but I saw the shadow of something standing there. R Rufus, stop it right now! It was met with silence again. I was met with a terrible sound. It sounded like when a dog yawns and their voice stretches and bends. But this had purpose. This wasn't just a noise. It was measured, meaningful. Get out of my house! I screamed in terror as it continued. Get out now! The sound stopped. The shadow at my door was slowly and clumsily plodding away. I shook, my breath coming in gasps. I stayed awake in my room for the rest of the day until finally thirst gripped me and I couldn't bear it any longer. I left the room armed with the small pistol I keep for safety. There he was, curled up in his dog bed fast asleep. I kept my eyes locked on him as I tiptoed around, gathering food and water before dashing to my room. I type this now to you, asking the community of people who deal with these things. If I call the cops, they'll call animal control. They'll either laugh in my face or simply take Rufus. I don't want that. I want my Rufus back. My good boy. What's happening to him? Why is... Why is he like this?